Give me a little beat. When I get to this age, in my 80s, I still have that desire, that passion, to express something that has never been painted before. I found this way that I could paint tide pools, and I could throw paint at the canvas and do it in a controlled way. So it was like controlled chaos. I, I did a painting at one time which I was totally exasperated with, and I literally, I mean, I have a temper. I took out a brush filled with paint and I threw it at the canvas, at the panel. And now I had remorse because I had screwed up a perfectly good painting because of one passage. So I started to wipe it off. I tried to brush it off and when I brushed it off I got this incredible three-dimensional quality from this area. I'm Lawrence Sisson, otherwise known as Lonnie Sisson. I chose Lonnie because Larry didn't sound right when I was in the fourth or fifth grade, so I changed my name to Lonnie. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. You can probably tell from the accent. But I was, uh, as a young kid, when I had chicken pox, my parents put me in a quarantine. In those days, we had to go in a room for a couple of weeks, literally stay away from the rest of the kids. So they gave me a little easel and a little pad and some paints and they basically shut me off from the world for that period of time. And apparently when I got out of quarantine, they thought I was gonna be a great artist. They just came out and said, well, Lonnie, that's beautiful work. You have gotta keep drawing and painting. So I did. When my parents had friends come in, they would all come over and just say, this is the fantastic work. And of course, I got so much encouragement that I almost felt I must be gonna be an artist. That's all there was to it. Lawrence is a, an iconic American painter. Uh, he was given full academician to the American Watercolor Society when he was 17 years old. He's painting a, a, a visual emotion. You know, you look at them and you just, you just have to, you can't walk on by, you have to stop and look. How did he do that? They are, I mean, you see around here, they're all bright, vibrant, lots, lots of clouds, lots of blue, lots of colors in them. When I was determined I was gonna be a, a painter, I enrolled at the Worcester Museum School, which was a wonderful small school. And at that point, I knew I'd have to go in the Army, so I enlisted when I was 17. But they sent us to Japan. I traveled all over Japan. I wound up eventually playing piano. Enjoyed it all the time. Uh, played the piano at night. During the day, I was able to go into the small towns. And I traded pipe tobacco for Hiroshige prints and Hokusai's and Utamaro's. And I just fell in love with the art of Japan. And uh, that stayed with me. I just loved the images and the, the kind of uh, angular quality and the rhythmic uh, uh, arabesque quality of some of the printmakers. I went back to Japan 40 years later and uh, I got a glimpse of Fuji and there it was, the most majestic single thing I'd ever seen. Something about Fuji is so magnificent and so spiritual even if you're not a Buddhist or a Hindu. When I really had something I wanted to say, or if I had a sp spiritual awakening that I wanted to paint, something in nature that was a fantastic passage of forest snow, or some beautiful wave uh, breaking off of uh, burnt island, uh, and, or a great sky that I saw. If I saw something like that, I wanted to have enough skill so that immediately I could pick up a brush and paint it in five, less than five minutes. Painting is an obsession if you're that involved. 
and I developed a language that I could use to express my, uh, my feelings about the ocean, my feelings about Maine. I enjoy the, the, the process of painting. I always hope the next time I do stand in front of a white canvas or build a huge panel that I'm going to come up, finally come up with something that is really powerful, that will be remembered. Santa Fe captured my imagination because I had seen work about by Taos founders. There was a symbiosis between the subject matter that I was painting here, that I've been painting out here for the last 30 years, as, and I still paint Maine from, again, from the memory. Sometimes the memory, as we know, is more powerful than the reality. And I began to uh, find images that I would never see in Maine, although I thought when I came out here I was going to I was going to go nuts because there wouldn't be any pebbles, there wouldn't be any rocks, there wouldn't be any shale, there wouldn't be any of the beach gurry that I miss so much in, in Maine. Yet the very first time I went up to the Nambe Falls, and at the base of the falls, here were all my rocks again, all the pebbles, all the rocks, all the things, plus Indian shards and wonderful little peach pieces of adobe and chips off of the redstone and the, and the chinley rock and the... I mean, it just was marvelous. Then I realized, why not? That's, the sea came through here long before anybody thought of the civilization that would be coming. So the, the, the landscape, the desert, was the floor of the sea. And out here, the islands became the mesas and the ocean became the desert floor. But there were certain elements of main seascapes that were becoming the underlying architecture of my desert work. So it became a perfect symbiosis. Really. I had a show once called Maine, the Moon, and Me because it was all about the moon and about Maine and it was about my feelings about the ocean and how the moon affects the tides. We don't have tides without the gravitational pull of the moon. And when you live along the ocean, you most of your friends who are fishermen or who deal with the ocean in some way, peripherally. They're very aware of the tide. It's an allegory of the moon. It's there. You can't ignore it. It's there. It's not softened with any soft edges. It's the moon pulling the ocean. And right at the top of the edge of the moon and the sea, everything else flows up to that point in the painting, theoretically. But I just, I just love the movement of the ocean. I love trying to paint surf. To this day, thank God, Judy, she just says, isn't it wonderful? He keeps painting, he's 83, and he's painting every day, and he loves to paint, and it's the only thing he can do. Someone asked me the other day, um, what's on your bucket list? The only thing on my bucket list relative to painting that I would like to do, and that is I would love, it's impossible, but I'd love to hire a warehouse and get every painting I've ever done and put it in that warehouse. It'd have to be awfully big so I could once in my life see what the hell it is I've painted. I think that's enough for now.